let's begin the technical part of this course with a short introduction into some basic concepts. This course really follows two main objectives. The first and most obvious is for you to learn something about linear systems, where linear system refers to a dynamic system that can be written in a so-called state space representation. State space representations exist for continuous time and discrete time systems. In both cases, X is an n-dimensional vector that contains the system states. U is an m-dimensional vector that contains the control inputs. And Y is a p-dimensional vector that contains the system outputs. And A, B, C, and D are possibly time-varying matrices that have appropriate dimensions. The main difference is that for continuous time systems, the time variable, which is denoted with t, is assumed to be of a continuous nature. And correspondingly, the state update equation contains a time derivative of the state vector x, which is denoted with x dot. For discrete time systems, on the other hand, the time variable k is assumed to be of a discrete nature, meaning having the values 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And correspondingly, the state update equation is not given by a time derivative, but the state at the next time step is given by some expression of the state and the input at the previous time step. I assume that all of you have seen at least one of these state space representations before in a basic course on controls or on signal processing. We will get back to the state space representations later on in this course. For now, let's get to the second main objective of this course, which is maybe less obvious, and it's for you to learn something about doing research in engineering and equip you with the necessary mathematical skills to write scientifically founded papers. In particular, the goal is to develop your logical arguments and your mathematical proving techniques. And in fact, there is nothing better than the theory of linear systems to develop exactly these skills. This already provides a partial hint to the question posed on this slide, namely, why we look at linear systems. In fact, linear systems and the mathematical theory behind them, meaning in particular linear algebra and analysis, are extremely useful in many engineering applications. So linear systems appear again and again in mechanical and electrical applications and also in many other areas. They usually arise also from nonlinear systems via linearization. So even when you're dealing with nonlinear systems in practice, you will usually end up with a linear system because at some point or in some way, you will linearize your nonlinear system. Moreover, for linear systems, you have a fairly well understood and complete theory at your disposal which clearly separates them from nonlinear systems that are much less understood. And you have very powerful tools available for the analysis of these systems and for control design. And that's also one of the reasons why, even if you're dealing with a nonlinear system in practice, it is a very common approach to reduce it to a linear system because you have all of this theory, all of these tools for design and analysis at your disposal. To summarize, if there is any mathematical theory that you want to understand at a very deep level, then it's the theory of linear systems because in engineering it's used over and over again. And that's precisely the goal of this course, namely to understand linear systems at a very deep and abstract level and hence to obtain results that are very generally applicable in the domain of engineering. Next, 
about the question, why do we use this course on linear system theory to dig quite deep into the fields of linear algebra and analysis. And the reason is, besides being important for the theory of linear systems, of course, that these two mathematical subjects are really at the core of the mathematics in engineering and the sciences. So this basic theory is used almost in every discipline of engineering and science. They are also well understood and offer very general results that are applicable in many situations. Moreover, and that's very important for this course, it is simply a beautiful theory with elegant proofs and logical arguments, and hence it's an excellent practice field to educate your abstract thinking and logical reasoning skills. But besides being theoretically nice and interesting, it's very important to emphasize that, again, these results are very widely applicable and very useful in many practical situations. Despite all of these good reasons to acquaint yourself with linear algebra and analysis at a very deep level, there are, of course, also drawbacks. And the main drawback is, of course, that the subject is not easy and hence this course will be difficult and it will require a substantial investment of your time and some persistence. In other words, unless you are a genius, everyone will have to work hard in order to master the material of this course. So expect the difficulty level of this course to be high and in fact, it's comparable to that of a top graduate program at the top universities around the globe. In that respect, most of the class, including the exercises, are dedicated to proving theorems. I also assume that you are basically familiar with theorems and proofs from your undergraduate classes in mathematics, namely a theorem is a substantial true logical statement. However, not all logical statements are substantial and that's why in the literature you also find some other expressions for logical statements. One of them is a lemma and a lemma is a preparatory statement for a theorem. Some statements are also simply just less substantial than a theorem and these lesser statements are sometimes called propositions or facts. And finally, some logical statements are referred to as a corollary. And a corollary is an immediate consequence of a theorem. So a lemma is a preparatory statement for a theorem. And a corollary is a statement that follows immediately from a theorem. You may have seen these expressions before and you will certainly come across them very frequently once you start reading scientific literature. Other expressions that you sometimes find there are a conjecture and an axiom. And a conjecture is a logical statement that is suspected to be true, but it's not known to be true or it hasn't been proven to be true. A logical statement that cannot be proven by its nature, but it's just postulated as being true, is called an axiom. It is, of course, fair to ask why we follow this type of structure for our course. It may seem that this makes the understanding of the material harder, and that's because these type of texts are usually associated with being um, harder to understand in general. However, once you have started to read literature of this type quite regularly, you will find that structuring the text in such a way, meaning into definitions, theorems, examples, and so on, actually makes it much easier to follow. So it's not a formalism that's required to write scientific text, but rather it really makes it easier to read and to understand and also to use it as a reference. And since you will be asked 
to provide proofs also in your exercises, here's a hint on how to develop new proofs on your own. And this hint is that finding a proof, first of all, requires a very deep insight into the underlying statement itself. Of course, you also need to find a main idea for the proof, but many proof at attempts fail simply because the statement that should be proven is not fully understood. So in other words, proving statements forces you to get a very deep understanding of the statements themselves and the material of this course. Since proving statements is so critically important for the material of this course, part of this introduction is dedicated to the basic methods that exists for mathematical proofs. And we will go over them with an example of each in the following couple of slides. The most important proof types that you may have seen before are proof by deduction, proof by contraposition, proof by contradiction, proof by induction, proof by counterexample, and proof by exhaustion. There are a few more types of proofs that are used in some very special cases or in some very special area of mathematics, such as probabilistic proofs, computer-assisted proofs, and a few others. However, we won't be dealing with them as part of this course, and that's why they are in brackets here. Before we look at these proofs in more detail, we introduce some basic mathematical notation. A very essential type of notation are the quantifiers there exists and for all, which are represented by these two symbols here that will appear very frequently throughout the course and which are also very commonly found in the mathematical literature. To see how they are used, let's look at a first example, 1, 1, where we suppose that P is the set of all pots and L is the set of all lids. And then we propose the following two statements. First, there exists an L in the set of all lids such that for all P in the set of pots, L fits onto P. And the second statement, for all P in the set of pots, there exists an L in the set of lids such that L fits onto P. So here the column stands for the expression such that, for which sometimes also just a vertical line will be used. Now my questions to you are, first of all, to try to properly understand these two statements, and then to decide which one you find to be more intuitively correct. So please take a minute to think about these questions and maybe pause the video and after that, I will explain the answers. So what the first statement is saying in a very compact way is that there exists a specific lid in the set of lids such that for all pots in the set of pots, L will fit onto P. So a single lid will fit onto all of the pots. And the second statement is saying in a very compact way, for all pots that there are, there exists some L in the set of lids such that L fits onto P. So it's saying that for every pot, I can find some lid that fits onto this specific pot. So the difference is that the first statement is saying that I'm able to find a lid that fits onto every pot, whereas the second statement is saying, for every pot, I'm able to find a fitting lid. Hence, we have acknowledged that these are really two very different statements, and the second one is a lot more plausible than the first one. As a final remark, we will also use the quantifier that does not exist, which is simply the there exist symbol with a line crossing through it. 
Another basic notation that we will frequently use are sets. As you have probably seen before, sets are usually written with curly brackets. So for example, we could express the set of all lowercase letters in this way, where we have A, B, C, and so on, up to X, Y, Z in curly brackets. Example one, two shows how we could express the set of all black sheep, which we call B, by using a such that notation. In this case, we're using a vertical line for the such that expression. And we assume that S denotes the set of all sheep. And then the set of all black sheep, B, is defined as the set of all sheep in a set of sheeps, such that S is black. We will use this type of set-based expression with a qualifier such that very frequently throughout this course. By the way, this symbol here, the equality sign with a triangle on top, means equals by definition. So we're saying the left-hand side and the right-hand side are equal, but this equality results from a definition, in this case, of the letter B. Another important thing to understand about mathematical statements is the relationship between two expressions, in this case, for example, an expression A and an expression B. There are exactly three types of possible relationships for the expressions A and B, namely necessity, sufficiency, and necessity and sufficiency. However, in mathematical statements, they often come in different forms. So for example, for necessity, we could write A is necessary for B. Alternative expressions would be A holds if B holds. And sometimes this is even written more briefly by using this double arrow pointing in the direction of A. For sufficiency, it's the other way around. So we write A is sufficient for B or alternatively, A implies B, or again, to write it more briefly, we just use this double arrow, in this case, pointing towards the statement B. Finally, necessity and sufficiency is a combination of the other two. So it says A is necessary and sufficient for B. And we see this in mathematical statements quite often as a holds if and only if B holds and this if and only if is often abbreviated by an if with a double F. So here you really need to pay close attention to the second F in the if statement and this is not a typo but this stands for if and only if. Alternatively we sometimes see A and B are equivalent or A and B are related by this type of double arrow. All these expressions mean the same thing. Before we get to our proof examples, we introduce a little bit of further notation in terms of number sets. So an N with this um, type of blackboard writing stands for the set of all natural numbers. So all numbers that are integral and start from one. So one, two, three, four, and so on. Z is the set of all integral numbers. So compared to N, these, this set includes also a zero and all the negative numbers. R stands for the set of real numbers and C stands for the set of complex numbers. So to practice a little bit our set notation, we could express the set of complex numbers by this type of set notation where we say that C is the set of all numbers that can be written like this, and R and T are real numbers, and J stands for the square root of minus one, so it's the complex variable. We will also occasionally use a subscript to a number set in order to indicate that we mean only the positive parts of the number set, so if we just have a plus here, 
we mean all the set of all reals, which are positive. Or if we have a zero and a plus here, we mean all non-negative reals. So the set of all R in the set of reals such that R is greater than or equal to zero. We apply the same indices, for instance, also with a minus or a zero minus to mean the negative and non-positive numbers. And we also use these indices for the other number sets. So for example, we have that Z plus is equal to the set of natural numbers. For the purpose of our proof examples, we have now this very basic definition 1, 3 here, where we define what it means for an integral number z and z to be even or odd. And z is called even if there exists another integral number k in z, such that we can write z as 2 times k, and z is called odd if there exists a k in z such that we can write z as 2k plus 1. So very basic definition. A basic fact that we will not prove and take for granted here is fact 1,4. It says that every integral number z and z has to be either even or odd. This fact is not very hard to prove and I leave it up to you as an exercise. What we will prove now is lemma 1.5 that states that for any integral number z and z, z is odd if and only if z square is odd. The reason we prove this is not really because we're interested in the result itself or that we're going to use this result much during the course. Instead, the purpose here is to demonstrate the different proof concepts on this slide and the next two slides by developing a little theory, which is simple enough to really study the proof concepts rather than being interested in the results themselves. For the proof of lemma 1.5, we really need to split the proof into two parts because of this if and only if statement. We begin here with the first part of sufficiency and we choose as a proof method a proof by deduction. Proof by deduction means that we start with our initial statement, which is our claim, and we try to end up with um, our final statement, which is what we want to show, and in between we establish a sequence of mathematical expressions where always the next expressions logically follows from the previous expression. So for the sufficiency part of our statement that z is odd if and only if z square is odd, we start with the initial assumption that z is odd and we try to establish this logical chain to show that this implies that z square must be odd. For the first logical step, we just apply our definition 1.3 for what it means for z to be an odd number. And this definition states that z is an odd number if and only if there exists a k in the set of integral numbers such that I can write z as 2k plus 1. So what's important for every deduction step is that the step is based on a sound logical reason why it has to be the case. And here I state this logical reason explicitly in brackets, whereas later on sometimes these reasons are omitted if they are obvious. But it's important, of course, that you are always aware of the logical reason that you've just applied when you develop your own proofs. Next, of course, this fact implies that there exists a k in the set of integral numbers such that z squared can be expressed as 2k plus 1 times 2k plus 1. Now we can actually multiply these two expressions and get this expression here of 4k squared plus 4k plus 1. And of the first two terms, we can take a 2 out and we get to this expression here, where we recognize 
that the expression in this bracket here is again an integral number. So it follows that there exists a number L in Z such that Z squared is equal to 2L plus 1, where we have defined L as exactly this integral number. And if we take a close look at this expression, we see that this is exactly the definition of an odd number. So again, we may deduce that z squared must be odd by using definition 1.3. And this finishes the sufficiency part of our proof. The second part of our proof is about necessity. And for this part, we choose a proof by contraposition. Before we start the actual proof, let's look a little further behind the concept of a proof by contraposition. The main idea of the proof by contraposition is based on the logical fact that the statement A implies B is logically equivalent to the statement that not B implies not A. For an illustration of this fact, let's look at a quick example. So suppose we have here the set of all animals and a subset of the set of all animals is the set of all white animals. Another subset of the set of all animals which are white is the set of all sheep, where here we assume that all sheep are white when drawing this diagram. Now suppose we want to make the following claim. Let A be any animal. If A is a sheep, then A is white, which is obviously a true statement. The method of contraposition tells us that we may state exactly the same claim in an alternative form. Namely, let A be an animal. If A is not white, then A is not a sheep. So not the second statement implies not the first statement. By looking at our little diagram, we see that this alternative claim obviously also has to be true because if A is an animal that's not white, it is somewhere out here and so it cannot be a sheep. Now let's call this case case one and let's also look at an alternative case two where we again consider the set of all white animals. But now we assume that not all sheep are white, but there are also some sheep that are black. We can visually see this assumption in the diagram by the fact that now parts of the set of all sheep are now outside of the set of all white animals. Now for case two, we consider exactly the same claim as for case one, namely let A be any animal. If A is a sheep, then A is white, which now is obviously false. By using the method of contraposition, exactly the same claim can again be stated in an alternative form, saying let A be an animal. If A is not white, then A is not a sheep. Looking more closely at our little diagram, we see that this alternative claim must also be false because if A is not white, this means that A is somewhere outside of the blue set, then we cannot automatically deduce that A is not a sheep because even if A is outside of the blue set, it could still be inside of the red set. So as we expect, this alternative claim is also false. To summarize, the method of contraposition tells us that it is equivalent to prove A implies B or to prove not B implies not A. Now back to the proof of the necessity part of our lemma 1.5. By the method of contraposition, we have that c square is odd implies that z is odd is a claim that is logically equivalent to z is not odd implies that z square is not odd. So we may prove this alternative claim 
And in this case, we use again the method of proving this by deduction. We start with our initial claim, z is not odd. Then we apply fact 1.4, which tells us that this means that z is even. Hence, there exists a k in z such that z can be written as 2k by definition 1.3. By squaring this expression, it follows that there exists a k in z such that c squared equals to 2k squared or 4k squared or if we take out a 2, um, we get 2 times 2k squared where these 2k squared are again an integral number. By defining this integral number to be equal to another integral number l, we get that we can write z squared as 2l, which means that z squared must be an even number by the very definition of an even number 1.3. And finally, with fact 1.4, it follows that z squared is not odd, which is exactly what we wanted to show. So this completes the proof of the necessity part and we have now proven the sufficiency and necessity part. So our proof of lemma 1.5 is complete and we indicate a complete proof by a little square at the end of it. So this square stands for end of proof. Next, we have a little corollary 1.6, which follows pretty much immediately from lemma 1.5. And it says that let c in z be an integral number. z is even if and only if c squared is even. For the proof of corollary 1.6, we again apply the proof by contraposition. What will be special, however, is that we will do both directions at once. The reason we do this is that it makes the proof shorter and hence more elegant. So this is something we would always try to do whenever possible. In this case, the method of contraposition tells us that the statement z is even if and only if z square is even is equivalent to z is not even if and only if c square is not even. Here, you should definitely pause for a second and think about why this is the case. Now, proving this alternative claim is easy based on the result of lemma 1.5. In the first step, we have that z is not even is equivalent to z being odd by fact 1.4 then it immediately follows from lemma 1.5 that this is equivalent to z square being odd. And then we can again apply fact 1.4 to show that this is equivalent to z square not being even. And this completes the proof. Next, we introduce another definition of the set of rational numbers that we denote with this blackboard letter Q and it's defined as the set of all fractions of two integral numbers n and m. Using this definition, we can state our next theorem, which serves for the purpose of demonstrating our proving methods. This theorem is usually attributed to the mathematical school of Pythagoras, even though it was probably known much before his time. So for instance, to the ancient Babylonians. The most common proof, which is also the proof that we will look at, goes back to the mathematician Euclid. And the statement of this theorem is actually pretty simple. It says the number square root of two is not a rational number. So it cannot be represented as a fraction of n divided by m, where n and m are two integral numbers. For the proof of theorem 1.8, we choose a proof by contradiction, which works by assuming the opposite of the proposed claim, 
and then show by logical deduction that this would lead to a logical contradiction. So we assume for the sake of a contradiction that there exist two integral numbers n and m such that square root of 2 equals to n divided by m. The expression for the sake of a contradiction is something that you will usually see in a proof by contradiction. Something that you also will come across quite often is the term without loss of generality. And here, without any loss of generality, we may assume that the integral numbers n and m are not both even. Otherwise, if both of them were even, we could divide them repeatedly by 2 until at least one of them becomes odd. Now, we can start with the expression square root of 2 equals to n divided by m and make the following sequence of deduction steps. If we square both sides, we get that n squared divided by m squared equals to 2, which we can solve for n squared, so n squared equals to 2m squared, which is by definition 1.3, an even number, and therefore by corollary 1.6, n is an even number. Since n is an even number, it follows that there exists a k in the set of integral numbers such that n equals to 2k, that's by definition 1.3, and now we can substitute this into the equation up here, so n squared equal to 2m squared, and using that we can write n as 2k, we get that n squared equal to 2k squared equal to 4k squared, which must be equal to 2m squared, which is an equation that we can divide by a factor of 2 in order to get m squared equal to 2k squared. Since k squared is another integral number, we again have here the very definition of m squared being even, so by definition 1.3, and we can again apply our corollary 1.6 to get the fact that m is even. Hence, our assumption that square root of 2 can be written as the fraction of two integral numbers n and m, which cannot both be even, has, by logical deductions, led to two conclusions. First, n must be even, and second, m must be even, which is obviously a contradiction of our assumption, and therefore we have established the contradiction and our proof is complete. A simple corollary of theorem 1.8 would be corollary 1.9 stating that the set of rational numbers q is a strict subset of the set of real numbers r, which we also write in this short form. The proof of corollary 1.9 is fairly obvious. Nonetheless, we show it here for the purpose of demonstrating a proof by a counterexample. Usually, a counterexample is used to disprove a certain claim, but in this case we combine the counterexample with a contradiction argument. Clearly, what we have is that the set of rational numbers is a non-strict subset of the set of real numbers. Now, for the sake of a contradiction, assume that these two sets are equal, so q equal to r. By theorem 1.8, we've already found a counterexample to this assumption, namely the square root of 2, which is in the set of reals, but it's not in the set of rational numbers. So this counterexample establishes the desired contradiction to our assumption, and this completes our proof. Finally, we demonstrate the two remaining types of proofs, namely a proof by exhaustion and a proof by induction. For this, we first introduce our definition 1.10, where we define what it means for a integer number z to be divisible by another integer number y. And we say that z is divisible by y if there exists some integral number k in z such that z equals to k times y. As a remark, 
a special case is that z is divisible by 2 if and only if z is an even number. With this definition, lemma 1.11 states that the integral number z times z plus 1 is even for all possible integral numbers z in z. For the proof of lemma 1.11, we choose a proof by exhaustion. This means that we split up the proof into two or more cases, which are selected such that the combination of all of these cases makes up the set of all possible scenarios. By virtue of fact 1.4, z must be either an even number, which we call case 1, or an odd number, which we call case 2. So there's no other possibility than these two cases. Now we prove each of these two cases separately, starting with case 1. In case 1, we have that z is even, so there exists a k in the set of integral numbers, such that z equals to 2k. Therefore, there exists a k in z, such that z times z plus 1 can be written as 2k times 2k plus 1. Therefore, there exists an L in z, such that z times z plus 1 equals to 2L, where we have defined L as the number k times 2k plus 1. And finally, we can use definition 1.3 again to say that this means that z times z plus 1 is an even number. In case 2, we can proceed in a similar manner. Here we start from the fact that z is odd. So by definition 1.3, there exists a k in z such that z equals to 2k plus 1. Therefore, there exists a k in z such that z times z plus 1 is equal to 2k plus 1 times 2k plus 2, which can be written as 2 times 2k plus 1 times k plus 1, where we again see that this here is an integral number that we can define as L. So there exists an L in Z such that Z times Z plus 1 equal to 2L, and therefore Z times Z plus 1 is an even number. In summary, we have proven that in case Z is even, the number z times z plus 1 is even, and if z is odd, also the number z times z plus 1 is even. Since z has to be either even or odd, we have covered all cases, so we have completed our proof by exhaustion. Finally, we also want to look at an example for a proof by induction, and for this we have our theorem 1.12, that states that the number z cubed minus z, which is an integral number, is always divisible by 6 for all possible integral numbers z. So the proof method chosen for theorem 1.12 is the proof by induction. For the proof by induction, in a first step, we prove the claim for a particular case in this case for the choice of z equal to 1. In this case, we get that z cubed minus z equals to 1 minus 1, which equals to 0. And because 0 can be written as 0 times 6, by definition 1.10, we have that z cubed minus z is divisible by 6. The second step of the proof is the actual induction step. For this, we start from the fact that z cubed minus z is divisible by 6 for some z, which is also called the induction assumption. And based on this, we show that if we increase z by 1, then z plus 1 cubed minus z plus 1 is also divisible by 6. So by multiplying out z plus 1 cubed, we get z cubed plus 3z squared plus 3z plus 1 and minus z plus 1. 
by canceling out the plus one with the minus one here and reordering the remaining terms, we can write this as z cubed minus z plus 3z squared plus 3z, where we can define the first two terms as in expression A and the other two terms by an expression B. Now, clearly, since the expression z plus 1 cubed minus z plus 1 can be written as a plus b, this expression will be divisible by 6 if a and b are both divisible by 6. First, to prove that a is divisible by 6 is simple, since a equals to z cubed minus z, this exactly corresponds to our induction assumption. And second, in order to show that also b is divisible by 6, we take out from the expression 3z squared plus 3z, we take out 3z and we get a factorization of b equal to 3z times z plus 1. By lemma 1.11, however, z times z plus 1 is an even number and therefore there exists a k in z such that z times z plus 1 equals to 2k. Using this fact in our expression for b, we get that there exists a k in z such that b equal to 6k, which by definition 1.10 is exactly what we need in order for b to be divisible by 6. Hence, we have completed our induction argument. To summarize, we have shown that if c equal to 1, the expression z cubed minus z is divisible by 6. And by induction, we have shown that if z cubed minus z is divisible by 6, then I can increase z by 1. And in the number that results here will also be divisible by 6. Therefore, we may conclude that z cubed minus z is divisible by 6 for all numbers z greater than or equal to 1. To really complete our proof, what we would need to do is establish a second induction argument for z minus 1 cubed minus z minus 1 to establish the claim for all negative z. However, this proof is analogous to the proof above and therefore quite repetitive and I leave it here as an exercise and therefore we have completed our proof. In the remaining part of this introduction chapter, we will introduce some further basic notation and basic facts that we will need throughout the course. The first one is definition 1.13, which states that if x and y are two sets, the Cartesian product set of x and y is the set of all ordered pairs consisting of one element from x and one element from y. We write this Cartesian product by this cross here. So x cross y is by definition the set of ordered elements x and y, where x is in x and y is in y. Next up is the definition of a power set, which is defined for an arbitrary set x. And the power set of x, which is usually denoted 2 to the x, is the set of all possible subsets of x. So the power set of x equals by definition the set of all subsets of x. Note that the power set always contains the set x itself and the empty set which we denote by this crossed out zero. And that's because both x is a subset of x and also the empty set is a subset of x. So for an example, let's construct the power set of the set x, which contains three elements a, b, and c. So the power set of x includes all possible subsets of x, including the empty set, and of course each single element a, b, and c, but there are also other possible subsets of x 
namely the subset A and B, the subset A and C, and the subset B and C, and of course also the full set X, so A, B, and C. So if you want, you can think of the power set as a set of sets. Definition 1.15 introduces the fundamental concept of a function. So suppose we have two sets, x and y, which are two arbitrary sets. Then a function f from x to y, written in this way, is a relation that assigns to every element of x exactly one element of y. x is called the domain of f and y is called the codomain of f. To illustrate this definition, we again assume a simple case where x just consists of three elements and y also just consists of three elements. And then a function f assigns to every element of the domain x exactly one element in the codomain y. What's important in the definition of a function is that every element of the domain must be assigned exactly one element in the codomain. So x1 is assigned y1, x2 is assigned y2, and x3 is assigned also y2. So this does not mean that two elements of the domain can actually be assigned the same value in the codomain. And also, it does not mean that for every element in the codomain, there must exist an element in the domain that gets assigned to this element of the codomain. For some element x of the domain, the specific element that's assigned by a function f is also denoted f in brackets x. And this is, a, of course, a particular element of the codomain. The graph of a function f, which is denoted g of f, is actually a subset of the Cartesian product of the domain and the codomain. Strictly speaking, it is not the same as the function itself. It is just used to illustrate the behavior of the function. A very particular function is the identity function or just identity. It's denoted by a capital I and it maps from a set into itself. So for this function, the domain is the same set as the codomain and this function assigns for each element of X, the element itself. If we have two functions, G mapping from a set X into a set Y and F mapping from a set y into a set z, we can actually define the composition of these two functions g and f, which is another function that we write f composed with g, and the composition we indicate with this circle here. And it's a function that maps from x into z, because first g maps from x into y, and then f maps from y into z. And the corresponding function value is denoted by f of g of x, which is, of course, an element of z. A function f mapping from a domain x into a codomain y will be called injective or one-to-one -one if it satisfies a very particular property. Namely, for any two x1 and x2 in the domain, which are not equal, we also have to get function values that are not equal. To illustrate this, let's look at an example of an injective function. Here, the domain x has three values and the codomain y has four values. And our exemplary function f assigns to the value x1, the value y1, to x2, the value y2, and to x3, the value y4. Now this function is injective because whenever I choose different values in the domain, I will also get different corresponding values in the codomain. Then we have the concept of a left inverse of a function, which is another function that we call E 
and it maps from the codomain of f into the domain of f with the property that the composition e composed with y, which now maps from x to x, equals to the identity function on x. So e of f of x equals to x for all x of the domain. Looking again at our example of the injective function f, we see that this function admits a left inverse e that maps back from every value in the codomain of f to the corresponding value in the domain of f. It's not hard to realize that this fact actually generalizes and it's therefore stated in our fact 1.16, namely a function that maps from x to y has a left inverse if and only if it is injective. Another important class of functions are surjective functions. In order to understand what a surjective function is, we first need to define the concept of an image of a function. And the image of a function f is the set of elements in y that are assigned by at least one element in x. So in formal notation, image of f equals to the set of all f of x in y, such that x is an element of the domain x. Let's look at a brief example to illustrate this definition. And we take here, again, the same function f that maps from a domain x into a codomain y. And according to the definition, the image of f consists of all those elements of the codomain which get assigned by at least one element of the domain. So the image of f is a subset of the codomain y. Now a function is called surjective or onto if the image of f equals to the entire codomain y. So the particular function that we have drawn in our example would not be a surjective function because the image of f is only a subset of y and we're missing the element y3 in this case. An example of a function that is surjective is shown down here. And the function is surjective because for every element of the codomain, there exists at least one element of the domain that gets mapped into this element of the codomain. Next, a right inverse of a function that maps from x to y is another function g that maps from y to x with the property that the composition f composed with g is a function that maps from y to y and this function must equal to the identity function on y. So f of g of y must be equal to y for all y in the set y. Observe that for our example of a surjective function, there exists such a function g that maps from y to x, such that the composition of f with g is an inverse on the set y. Because first of all, g will map y1, for instance, to x1, then f will map it back, back to y1, y2 will be mapped to x3, and then back to y2, and y3 will be mapped to x4 and then back to y3. So g is actually a right inverse of f. It's not the only right inverse. There actually exists also another right inverse that instead of mapping y1 to x1 would map y1 to x2. However, for the example up here of a function that's not surjective, you cannot find a right inverse and you can verify this for yourself. So unsurprisingly, fact 117 states that a function has a right inverse if and only if it is surjective. Finally, we get to the class of bijective functions and a function f is called bijective if it is both surjective and injective. So by the previous two facts, 116 and 117, a bijective function has a left inverse and a right inverse at the same time. 
for bijective functions, we have now fact 118, namely, let f be a bijective function, then its left inverse, e, which exists because f is injective, and its right inverse, g, which exists because f is surjective, are actually identical. And two functions being identical, we denote in short with this triple equality sign. This identical function that maps from y to x is called the inverse function or simply the inverse of f and it's denoted f with a minus one for inverse in the exponent. And it satisfies of course that f inverse of f of x equals to f of f inverse of x equal to x for all elements x of the domain of f. Let's quickly look at the proof of fact 118. Since f is an injective function, there exists a function e such that e of f of x equal to the identity function. And because f is surjective, there exists a function g such that f of g of y equal to the identity function of y. Let's consider the function g that maps from y into x. And since g of y is an element of x, it clearly holds that g of y is the same as if I apply the identity map in x to g of y. From fact 116, we have that e of f of x is exactly the identity map on x. So we can write g of y as e of f of g of y. By fact 117, we have that f of g of y equals to the identity on y. So if we look at this composition of functions, here we discover the identity on y. By using this fact, we can simplify this equation to g of y equals to, and what's left of this expression here is just e of y. Looking at this expression, we have obtained exactly what we wanted, namely we have shown that g of y equals to e of y for all possible values of y, and hence the function g is the same as the function e. The rest of the statements in fact 118 follow directly from the properties of the left and the right inverses. Now, two more remarks about bijective functions. First, a function that possesses an inverse function is also called invertible. And second, a function is invertible if and only if it is bijective, which is immediate from facts 116, 117, and 118. The last thing we cover in this introductory chapter are the concepts of supremum and maximum, as well as infimum and minimum, which we will frequently use throughout the course. For these concepts, we need to look at a particular class of functions, namely those which map into R, so the codomain of the function is the set of real numbers, or actually, more generally, it could be any type of ordered set. Moreover, we suppose that S is some subset of the domain X of the function. Both concepts, namely that of a supremum and that of a maximum, have in common that they refer to the maximization of the function F of X inside the set S. The notation also looks similar for the supremum, the notation is the supremum taken over all x in s of the function f of x. And for the maximum, it's the maximum over all x in s of the function f of x. So far, so good. So that's what the supremum and the maximum have in common. Now, what's the difference between the two? The difference is that the supremum is more general because the maximum requires that its value is actually attained inside the set S, meaning that there must exist some element 
that I call x star inside the set S such that the maximum over all x in S of f of x actually equals to the function value achieved by x star. The supremum on the other hand only refers to the smallest upper bound which I call f bar of f of x inside the set S. So what we want is that f of x is less than or equal to f bar for all x in S and we want f bar to be the smallest value for which, for which this is the case. So obviously every maximum is also a supremum but as we shall see shortly not every supremum is a maximum. For this purpose let's actually look at two specific examples. The first one is the cosine function that maps from the reals into the reals and we're interested in the supremum over all x in the reals of the function cosine of x. From a small sketch of that function we immediately see that the smallest upper bound of the function cosine x over all x in the reals will be equal to 1. And this supremum is actually attained because there exists at least one value x star, in this case here x star equal to 0, such that cosine of x star is equal to the supremum, namely equal to 1. And therefore we can deduce that this supremum is actually a maximum. As we can see from the second example, this does not need to be the case. In the second example, we look at the Arcus tangent function that also maps from R into R, and we look at the supremum of the Arcus tangent over all x in the positive reals, which will turn out not to be a maximum. And this is what it looks like. So it's a function that approaches minus pi half as x goes to minus infinity and it approaches pi half as x goes to infinity. So the smallest upper bound of this function over all positive reals equals to plus pi half. However, there does not exist any specific value of x for which this supremum is actually attained. In other words, there's no real number for which the Arcus tangent of x is actually equal to plus pi half. It just comes arbitrarily close, but there is no value that actually achieves plus pi half. And therefore, in the second example, this supremum is not a maximum. The same idea applies to the concepts of an infimum versus a minimum. So again, we consider a function that maps from a set x into the reals and we let s be a subset of the domain of f. Both the infimum and the minimum now refer to the minimization of a function f of x. The notation is analogous to the supremum and the maximum. Now the infimum is more general because the minimum requires that its value is actually attained, meaning that there actually exists an x star in the subset S such that the minimum over all x in S of f of x equals to f of x star. In contrast to that, the infimum refers to the highest lower bound, which we denote by an underlined f of f of x. So what we must have is that f of x is less than or equal to f underline for all x in s and we want for this the highest value of f underline for which this is the case. As a final remark about these concepts we can say that the expressions max and min for maximum and minimum may only be used if it is actually known that such a maximum or minimum exists. Otherwise, we have to 
stick to the more general concepts of the supremum and the infimum. Finally, we also have the concepts of argmin and argmax, which stands for the argument of the minimum and the argument of the maximum. And to explain these concepts, suppose that a maximum of a function f bar, which is the maximum over all x in s of f of x, exists. So we really have an existing maximum. Then the set of all x in s, which attain this maximum, are denoted by the argmax. So the argmax over all x in s of f of x is equal to the set of all x star in s, such that f of x star equals to this maximum value f bar. This is, of course, analogous for the argmin. So for the argmin, we assume that the minimum over all x in s of f of x exists, and we call this minimum an f underline. Then the set of all x in s which attain this minimum are denoted by the argmin. To point out the difference between the min and max and the argmin and argmax more explicit, note that the maximum and the minimum are values in R, whereas the argmax and the argmin are actually sets. Let's also illustrate the difference by two examples. The first one is the minimum over all x in R of the function x minus 1 squared. If we sketch this function, it looks like a parabola whose apex lies at the location x equal to 1. Clearly, the highest lower bound of this parabola will be equal to 0. So therefore, the minimum over x minus 1 squared is equal to 0. And now the argmin doesn't search for this minimum value on the y-axis, but it searches for those values of x that actually attain this minimum. And in this case, there's only a single point that attains this minimum, and it's the point of x equal to 1. So therefore, the argmin over all x in R of x minus 1 squared equals to the single point 1. Now, for the second example, we look at the function cosine of x. It was already seen before that the maximum of cosine of x over all x in R equals to 1. That's because the smallest upper bound of this function equals to 1. But now we'll also look at the argmax over all x in R of cosine of x, meaning we're not looking on the y-axis, which one is the maximum value that can be achieved by this function. But now we look on the x-axis for the actual values of x that attain this maximum. Looking at this little sketch of the function cosine of x, we realize that actually an infinite number of possible x values attain this maximum, starting, for instance, with x equal to 0, then again with x equal to 2 pi, then also x equal to 4 pi, 6 pi, and so on, but also x equal to minus 2 pi, minus 4 pi, and so on. Hence, we conclude that the argmax over all x in R of cosine x is an infinite set that contains all integral multiples of 2 pi.